All right, guys, Fascia Friday, Episode 3. This week, we're going to be taking a look at stretching and mobilizing the fascial system. And I wanted to start this out with a very broad and and, and succinct statement in that not all flexibility and mobility are created equal. And that's a really important thing to understand. Um, You know, I think sometimes because flexibility, mobility work looks so passive or innocuous, you know, superficially, um, and also in conjunction with it becoming more trendy, that we just start to you know, frivolously apply it to everybody and, and you know, kind of lose uh, sight of what the speci- specific needs are of the athlete. So with that, we want to, you know, start by identifying where the deficits are. And with this one, I want to take a look here to the right first. And these are two of the the fundamental questions that, that determine a lot of programming and exercise selection for me. But this one is actually probably my number one indicator here. And that is, are they limited in active range of motion or passive range of motion? So with active range of motion, the athlete is achieving the range of motion on their own without assistance, whereas a passive range of motion is somebody taking them through that range of motion. An active range of motion deficit is going to infer more of a motor control strength or a stability deficit, whereas the passive range of motion is going to suggest more of a tissue extensibility or a mobility issue. So that right there is going to determine quite a bit for us. And, you know, again, really helps with governing exercise selection and programming. Similarly, although it's a little bit more ambiguous, too stiff or too soft is another one that I utilize heavily. And I just look at the natural organic uh, movements and patterns. And do they look like they are clunky and disconnected and just heavy or arduous? Or are they flimsy flailing all over the place and just have no sense of stability or control at all? Those, Those, again, are going to determine quite a bit of the programming. From there, additionally, we want to look at, you know, do they have any circulation impairments? Are there adhesions, bindings, crampings, uh, you know, difficulty with movement flow? Are they overtly too stiff or are they, do they have a strength or a speed deficit? Because again, even though this is a conversation about stretching and mobilizing, those factors are going to directly contribute to the bigger ticket items such as strength and speed. And we want to make sure that we're hitting it on the right end. The image today is going to be uh, fr- taken from a YouTube video uh, from a, a, a page called Catalyst University, and uh, I cannot encourage you all enough to go watch that video independently. He does a phenomenal job breaking down the stress-strain curve, but to give you the nuts and bolts of it here, when we're looking at a stress-strain curve, we have a couple of different areas that are that are specific and that we want to make sure we understand, the first being the toe region. So the toe region is where the collagen fibers start to unfurl or uncrip. So this is where you know, we're getting a little bit of uh, lengthening to kind of get the tissue or the collagen fibers back to equilibrium so that there can be strain applied with movement. Second, we have from here to here, the elastic region and the elastic region represents the ability for the tissue to stretch and then still return to form. Here being our yield point, this is the delineation between the elastic and the plastic regions. And in the plastic regions on one end, while this is where we are able to drive true change and adaptation. This is also where the the potential for injury starts to rise. So we need to be careful in this region. We have to get to the plastic region, but if we go too far, then we get into the failure point, and this is where ruptures and, and injuries occur. So taking that and tying it into our general principles here, I bet you didn't think you were going to watch a video on stretching and mobilizing and then have someone tell you that the first priority of general principles is that tissues must be loaded heavy at that in order to drive lasting change. And that's because we have to tap into this plastic region. Using the Achilles as an easy example here, that region of the ankle, if we if we put too much strain on the Achilles, we get an injury. But if we don't put enough on it, we never make any lasting change. So we really got to find that sweet spot. In addition, stretching and mobility alone as as passive modalities or or even as active modalities are just an incomplete solution. They're a part of the recipe, but we need to make sure that we are complementing it with other things. The rate of force or the rate at which the stretch is being applied is going to be a factor, and then in which vector that applied stress is being uh, placed is going to be a factor as well. The elastic strength or the extensibility is a key factor. And then we also want to look at just the general tissue quality and the health factors. You know, are they under a lot of stress? Are there changes at work or family life? You know, what is their general wellness like? If we're not eating right, if we're not sleeping, if we're not hydrated, we can do anything in the gym and it's just going to come at a reduced uh, benefit or or at a reduced uh, takeaway. And lastly, we just want to make sure that, you know, we are appropriately distributed. So looking at it as tension versus compression, you know, where do we need to redistribute or recalibrate things? And basically with that, you're going to achieve that by going through the the items you know that are listed here above but we want to make sure that we are at least gauging that so now for the applications piece 
I start this out by just looking at it from each individual property of the fascial system. So we spoke about this in last week's episode, but we have viscous, elastic, and plastic properties. So are they most limited by tissue glide or ability to just move effortlessly or seamlessly? Or are they more limited by you know springiness or ability to create stiffness? Or is it a terminal end range capacity problem? So just limited it at end range. And each of these is going to have its own set of, of solutions here. But for tissue glide, what we want to think initially is simply stimulate, circulate, and hydrate. So these are athletes who have limited passive ranges of motion, chronic tightness or chronic discomfort, discomfort or pain, or they're limited in their ability to bend or be pliable with movement. So for these athletes, we really just want to promote global movement. Obviously, this is going to be multi-planar and multi-tempo. We want to think long duration with this, so a minute or, or 90 seconds or beyond. Um, and this is uh, specifically speaking to the viscoelastic properties, but we do need to be at about 60 seconds and up for there to be true change. And then we want to improve the tissue circulation. So for these, uh, for these athletes, we're thinking about low-level plyos. We're thinking dynamic stretching. Aerobic strength circuits are something that I've gotten a ton of value out of. So very minimal load, but just doing continuous movement in a multitude of directions, multiple patterns for 40 minutes. And then soft tissue work traction, tempering, flossing, body work, you know, there's a host of different options here and, and none are necessarily inherently right or wrong, but, you know, this is where we want to try to get the tissues to glide better <clears throat> because remember we have multiple layers of fascia and a lot of the times what we call trigger points, we think to the, the muscle being knotted up, a lot of the times it's really just the, the layers of fascia being matted down and, 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 and unable to move or glide when needed. For athletes who are having trouble more with the elastic properties, so we're thinking too stiff, we're thinking poor force transfer or poor terminal speed or, or distal speed. For these, we want to look to submaximal loading, dynamic movements, and propulsive type of actions. So movements that are, you know, uh, initiating the stretch shortening cycle series elastic component, you know, which is going to require some load. With the viscous properties where we're looking at a minute and up, with the elastic properties, we're actually thinking about a second or less. So these are going to be very short and quick iterations. Um, and this is going to you know, help us obviously also drive the, uh, the tissue reflexive properties. But for these, we're thinking extensive plyos, so you know, low effort, but higher, you know, somewhat higher than we would for viscous properties. Ballistic stretching, submaximal strength circuits. Band unloading is a good one because the band unloading allows them to move at a faster rate than their body is naturally capable of. And med, med ball variations are just a really great bang for your buck here. And to round it out for the plastic properties, so we're thinking about end range and, and terminal capacity. This is going to require maximum intent, revert back to our stress strain chart from a second ago, high force or intensive, and then time under tension is a big one. So for these athletes, we're thinking about emphasizing high force terminal action movements, tempo emphasis, a lot of eccentrics, a lot of isometrics, and improve the tissue uh, tolerance. So for here, we're thinking high force intensive plyos, PNF type of stretching, max strength effort. So we're thinking above 80-ish, 85%. And then again, tempo applications and positional efforts are going to be game changers here. So to round that all out with the stretching and the mobilization piece, this isn't, you know, just laying on the floor, flailing around with a band. This isn't something that everybody needs to do the same. It should not be generalized. This is, is, is as much of an individualistic endeavor as strength and speed work are. And when we're looking at it from the fascial system, are they limited by bend? Are they limited by stiffness? Are they limited at terminal range? A lot of these are going to be obvious answers. And we just need to fill in on the back end with what we see as needed most.